Hello everyone, welcome to my channel Anatomy by Dr. Vijaya. Today's topic I have selected from microanatomy that is histology of gastrointestinal tract. So these are the topic outlines. So I will be covering the concepts of histology of GI tract in uh, three separate videos. So this will be the part one video where I'll be covering the general organization of GI tract, then the histology of uh, oral cavity and uh, the histology of esophagus. So let us know about the general organization of GI tract. So you all know that digestive system consists of digestive tract which extends from the oral cavity till the rectum and the anus and uh, it has the accessory uh, or associated glands like salivary glands, uh, pancreas and liver. So the here I will be focusing mainly on the GI tract or the digestive tract. So when you see the digestive tract it is a hollow tube with a lumen and has a wall uh, which is made up of four main layers. <clears throat> so the, those four main layers are the mucosa, the innermost one, then the submucosa, then there is a muscular, the muscle layer which is called as muscularis externa and serosa or adventitia. So why there are two separate names over here, the serosa or adventitia. So when you see the whole GI, the uh, organs of the GI tract. So some of the organs are enclosed within a layer of connective tissue called as uh, peritoneum. But some are doesn't, they are not within the peritoneum. So they just have the peritoneum uh, either in front forming a retroperitoneal organs. But some are enclosed within the peritoneum. So the organs which are enclosed within the peritoneum, so that organ will have the outermost layer will be called as serosa and the one which doesn't have which is not enclosed within the peritoneum so they'll have just the connective tissue which is called as adventitia okay so these are the four main layers of the gi tract mucosa submucosa muscularis externa serosa or adventitia so here you can see the hollow tube. So this is the mucosal layer. Okay, again the mucosal layer is subdivided into sub layers. Okay, and within the mucosa you can also see a thin layer of muscle, smooth muscle cells. So this is named as muscularis mucosae because since it is present in the mucosal layer or sometimes it is called as muscularis interna okay because it is at the internal aspect okay muscularis mucosae or muscularis interna both are the same and here the yellow one represents the submucosa having uh, blood vessels lymphatic vessels and, and in certain organs you can also see the glands the mucosal glands so uh, they are called as submucosal glands then the outermost here you can see the muscularis externa where the smooth muscles are arranged in uh, different layers so mainly there are two layers but at certain area there can be three more than two okay so those are outer longitudinal okay and inner circular so this forms the muscularis externa and the outermost layer is the serosa or adventitia so let us know about the each layer in detail so the mucosa as I mentioned, again, it has three sub layers. So they are formed by uh, epithelium. Okay, then there is lamina propria and muscularis mucosa. Okay, so the epithelium is a lining, uh, mainly lines the inside of the lumen. Then there is lamina propria having a loose connective tissue, which are and also and this tissue is uh, rich in uh, blood and lymphatic vessels. Then you can see a thin layer of smooth muscle. So uh, they are sometimes they are arranged in two layers in a circular and outer longitudinal. Especially they help in changing the shape of the mucosa. So whenever there is necessary for the movement 
of the mucosal layer. So uh, if there is necessary for the change in the shape of the mucosa, so this uh, muscle layer contracts and helps in the change in the shape of the mucosa. So the next layer will be submucosa. So here you will be seeing dense connective tissue that mainly contains blood vessels, lymphatics. There are sometimes you can see lymphoid follicles, big nodules, lymphoid nodules, and it also has nerves and uh, nerve plexus, so which are parasympathetic in nature. So they are mainly parasympathetic ganglia. So ganglia means group of nerve cell bodies lying outside the central nervous system. So they have parasympathetic in function. So these are specially named as uh, mesenus plexus, okay, or submucosal uh, nerve plexus or mesenus plexus. Mm -hmm. And at certain parts of uh, submucosa, uh, like in duodenum and esophagus, uh, in the submucosa, you will be seeing some mucosal glands, okay. So these are the main features in the submucosa of the GI tract, okay. The next is muscularis externa, uh, which is a layer of smooth muscle arranged in generally they are arranged in two layers but at certain parts there can be more than two so inner circular and outer longitudinal so the function of this smooth muscle is they are responsible for peristaltic movement mainly helping in movement of the uh, ingested food and in between the two layers that is inner circular and outer longitudinal there is a group of nerve plexus again these are parasympathetic in nature so these are named as myentric plexus or or back plexus. Okay, uh, the nerve plexus present in the submucosa they are called as mesenus plexus, and the one which is present in the uh, <clears throat> muscularis externa will be called as myentric or or back plexus. The next, the outermost one is the serous or adventitia, as I mentioned earlier. If it is an intraperitoneal organ enclosed by a layer of peritoneum, so they are formed by thin connective tissue layer and it is covered by simple squamous epithelium. So they have an epithelial. So that simple squamous epithelium is called as mesothelium. Okay, for example, stomach, small intestine. Um, these are mainly covered by layer of peritoneum so there they'll uh, the outermost layer will be called a serosa and uh, other structures like uh, which are not intraperitoneal like duodenum and esophagus so these are extra peritoneal uh, organs so here you can see adventitia having a thin layer of connective tissue uh, which lacks uh, mesothelium Okay, so this is the difference between serosa and adventitia. Serosa has mesothelium, adventitia has just the connective tissue without mesothelium. Okay, this picture shows the all the four layers with the sub layers. So mucosa having epithelium, lamina propria, muscularis mucosae, sub mucosa with the uh, sub uh, mucosal glands at certain uh, region then blood vessels submucosal nerve plexus which are called as mesenus plexus then you can see muscularis externa having inner circular and outer longitudinal and in between there are myentric nerve plexus so both are parasympathetic in nature and then you can see the outermost is serosa because this is a, a section from a, a intestine small intestine having a layer of peritoneum that is the mesentery so that's why they have a, a thin layer of connective tissue with mesothelium so that's why this layer will be called as serosa so as we move on to, uh, to the different parts of the digestive tract so we will be uh, moving uh, we'll be talking in detail about the microscopic features of each parts of the digestive tract so the features depends upon the functions of each part so okay so so each part will be having different functions and the microscopic features are linked to the functions of each part of the digestive tract. So in generally, if you can, uh, if I can say the main function of the digestive tract, that is mainly the epithelium present, epithelial lining present in the digestive tract mainly helps in different functions. So in generally, they form a, they provide a selective permeable barrier. Uh, between the contents of the tract that is which are present in the lumen and the tissues 
of the body okay so they form a permeable barrier between them so that is one main function then it also facilitates as i mentioned earlier mainly facilitates in the transport of the uh, transport and also digestion of the food okay then a third is it promotes the absorption of the nutrients okay which are the products of digestion okay then it produces hormones which have the effect on the activity of the digestive system so okay so they also there are cells in certain areas of the digestive tract which secretes or produces hormones which will have an effect on the activity of the digestive system along with that there are uh, mucus secreting cells in the digestive tract which produces mucus for the lubrication and protection of the uh, wall okay so these are in general main functions of the digestive tract that is the epithelial lining of the digestive tract so let us know about uh, each part of the digestive tract in detail so first is the histology of oral cavity because once you ingest the food it has to pass through the oral cavity so the oral cavity has different uh, organs the main organ is tongue then uh, if you see the outer part you can see the lips then it enters the uh, uh, once it enters the oral cavity you will be seeing tongue teeth then gums then you will see hard palate soft palate then it enters the pharynx and from pharynx it enters the esophagus so let us know about the oral cavity so the oral cavity is mainly lined by stratified squamous epithelium so this epithelium either at certain region they are keratinized and as in certain region they are non keratinized so both types you will be seeing you will be seeing keratinized stratified squamous epithelium at certain areas non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium in other regions of the oral cavity so where do you see keratinized so the regions which has keratinized epithelium so there will be layer of keratin so their main function is to protect the oral mucosa from damage during mastication okay so during mastication there is friction so the lining should be protected so they have a keratin layer so this is mainly seen lining the gingiva that is the gums and the hard palate so those areas you will be seeing keratinized stratified squamous epithelium then the lamina propria of these region has many projections which are called as papillae which are uh, resting directly on the bony tissue okay for example if you see hard palate the mucous membrane they directly rests on the uh, hard palate okay the non keratinized uh, stratified squamous epithelium lines the soft palate area lips cheeks and the floor of the mouth okay so here the here even the lamina propria has papillae similar to those which you can see in the dermis of the skin and it is continuous with the submucosa containing uh, they have some diffuse small salivary glands okay then in the soft palate you will be also seeing some layers of striated muscles as well and even in the lips you will be seeing some group of uh, striated muscles and as you go to the outer part mainly the inner part has non keratinized stratified squamous squamous epithelium but as you go to the outer part the lips will be continuous with the skin area so there it will be transition there will be a transition from keratinized sorry non keratinized to keratinized epithelium because the skin mainly has keratinized stratified squamous epithelium okay so these are the main features uh, of the oral cavity the microscopic features of oral cavity so a certain area there are keratinized stratified squamous epithelium and in other uh, regions there will be non keratinized epithelium let us move on to the histology of tongue so when you see a tongue tongue is a mass of uh, striated muscle and it is covered by a mucous membrane okay so uh, they have a thick group of muscles and they are covered by the mucous membrane and tongue is a it's a principal organ of sense of taste so taste sensation mainly is carried from the uh, tongue so there are taste buds specialized cells over there which carries the sensation of taste and as i mentioned earlier it is a mass of uh, 
striated muscle which uh, on contraction there will be diff change in the shape of the tongue which is very important because for the because tongue is an important organ of speech okay and also uh, the tongue movement help assist in the mastication and the deglutition of the food okay and initial breakdown of the carbohydrate takes place over there by chewing and mastication okay so the tongue is mainly situated in the floor of the mouth within the curve of the body of the mandible okay so mainly uh, if you see the tongue grossly it is divided into different parts so it has root apex inferior surface and dorsum or dorsal surface so here in this picture this is showing the dorsal surface of the tongue so when a person protrudes the tongue so the area the surface which you see will be the dorsal surface and when you lift the tongue so that is the inferior surface so the mucous membrane covering the dorsal surface will be rough because you will be seeing many bulgings and many projections or papillae over there but the mucous membrane lining the lower surface will be smooth so this is the dorsal surface of the tongue the picture is showing the dorsal surface both the picture so this is the apex of the tongue and this is the body of the tongue the posterior part is the root of the tongue so when you see the dorsal surface it is broadly classified or divided not classified it is divided into two parts anterior two third which forms the body of the tongue and posterior one third which forms the root of the tongue so these two anterior two third and posterior one third is divided by a v-shaped sulcus which you can see over here so this v-shaped sulcus is called as sulcus terminalis or terminal sulcus okay so this v-shaped sulcus will divide the tongue into anterior two-third and posterior one-third so anterior two-third has small projections and it is rough due to the presence of uh, many papillae okay so there are different types of papillae covering the uh, anterior two, two third of the tongue as you go to the posterior one third the posterior part which forms the root of the tongue has many bulgings and lymphatic follicles and these are called as lingual tonsil okay so here you can see lymphatic nodules which are called as lingual tonsil on either side on the sides of the tongue you can see a very important tonsil bounded by two arches okay uh, which which is nothing but the arch is nothing but a layer of mucous membrane covering the uh, part of a muscle okay so they have this tonsil is called has the palatine tonsil so which is bounded by two arches palatoglossal arch and palatopharyngeal arch so this is the palatine tonsil and this is the lingual tonsil so these two tonsils which will form the part of the valdeus ring okay so there is a group of lymphatic rings at the posterior part of the oral cavity so uh, these tonsils will form a part of it okay mm, there are adenoids there is pharyngeal tonsils palatine tonsils lingual tonsils okay so lingual tonsils are mainly present on the posterior one third of the tongue and on either side you will be seeing the palatine tonsil bounded by the two arches so in the anterior two third of the tongue you as i mentioned earlier you will be seeing many projections which are called as papillae and here you can see the median sulcus which divides the tongue into two symmetrical halves okay so this is the median sulcus this is sulcus terminalis <coughs> so median sulcus divides into symmetrical halves then exactly at the center of the sulcus terminalis that is about 2.5 cm from the root of the tongue you will be seeing a depression called as foramen cecum okay so this foramen cecum uh, it is an embryological uh, remnant of a duct uh, as you uh, know that the tongue develops from the pharyngeal arches and there are also other structures developing from pharyngeal arches one of them is thyroid gland so which develops in uh, at the upper part and then descends down so once it descends down there's a formation of a duct called as thyroglossal duct okay so this duct disappears later once there is descent of the thyrogland thyroid gland so since it is attached the name only tells thyroglossal duct it is between the root of the tongue and the thyroid gland so after it disappears 
so the area the region where this duct was present in the uh, tongue so that forms a depression which is called as foramen cecum okay from which a shallow groove so in the it is exactly at the center of the sulcus terminalis uh, which runs lateral word and forward on either side of uh, either side to the margin of the tongue so at the center you see this depression called as foramen cecum which is a uh, embryological remnant of thyroglossal duct so the part of the dorsum of the tongue lying in front of this groove forms anterior two third or the body of the tongue which is rough and covered with lingual papillae and posterior one third which forms the root of the tongue contains numerous bulgings and lymphatic nodules so those bulgings are nothing but those lymph nodules are nothing but lingual tonsil so the body of the tongue is mainly lined by or covered by stratified squamous epithelium so they have a course of connective tissue covered by stratified squamous epithelium okay and as i mentioned there are papillae these are nothing but projections uh, present at the anterior two third of the tongue so there are different types of papillae so those are valate or circumvallate papillae piliform papillae fungiform and foliate so these are the four main types of papillae present on the dorsum of the tongue especially at the anterior two thirds of the tongue so here you can see this is the anterior two third the these are the microscopic uh, picture of the different papillae so the most abundant the most numerous papillae abundantly present is the filiform papillae so these are conical in shape pointed uh, papillae so they have the core of connective tissue lined by stratified squamous epithelium so they are pointed or conical in shape so this filiform papillae doesn't have any taste buds so they are mechanical in function so uh, they actually um, provide friction and they give uh, protection to the surface of the tongue so they mainly have a keratin layer so once the keratin layer is formed they look whitish or uh, grayish in color okay so their uh, their main function is mechanical so they don't have any taste but okay so they mainly help in the uh, food um, ingestion okay so they mainly help in uh, chewing and mastication of the food and helps in movement of the uh, food okay into the or uh, posterior aspect of the oral cavity which leads into the pharynx then the next is fungiform papillae which are in between the filiform papillae they are mushroom shaped okay so they have a broad uh, upper aspect with somewhat mushroom shape uh, and uh, they have few taste buds at the upper aspects which you can see over here okay the next type is the foliate papillae which are lesser in number in adults but they are very well developed in uh, young uh, children so which you can see on the sides of the dorsum of the tongue here so they form a striations at the sides okay so these are called as foliate papillae even these have few taste buds okay the fungiform and foliate has few taste buds the filiform doesn't have any taste buds the next the largest papillae which are arranged in front of uh, sulcus terminalis as i mentioned this is a sulcus terminalis okay so here you can see the um, this is a sulcus terminalis so in front of sulcus terminalis you can see all this round circular shaped uh, uh, structure that is the papillae which are called as circumvallate papillae okay so these are the largest uh, papillae okay so they have uh, uh, many taste buds on the uh, sides okay you can see here these are the taste buds uh, they have number of taste buds so their main function this valate papillae foliate fungiform so they mainly carry the taste sensation okay so this picture shows the structure of taste buds okay so this is in a higher magnification <clears throat> so these are the different types of papillae present on the anterior two third of the dorsum of the tongue so this is the hnd staining that is hematoxylin and eosin staining so you here you can see different uh, papillae this is fungiform as it has a broad upper aspect 
This is filiform, which is pointed or conical in shape. So you can see the keratin formation over here. As I mentioned, they have mechanical in function. So this is the stratified squamous epithelium. SS represents stratified squamous epithelium. And these are the connective tissue, the core of connective tissue. This picture shows the circumvallate papillae having stratified squamous epithelium. This TB represents the taste buds. CT represents the connective tissue and these are the glands. Okay, so there are some few uh, salivary glands uh, present over here. Okay. <clears throat> so, as you can see, the taste buds, the taste buds are also present in other areas as well. For example, even in the soft palate, not only in the uh, tongue, they are also present in soft palate. So, when you see the structure of the taste buds, they are uh, oval in shape. So these are ovoid structure having different uh, uh, cells. So they are uh, in between within the actually within the stratified squamous epithelium. So here you can see stratified squamous epithelium. So in between you can see this uh, ovoid structure. That's the taste bud which is made up of around 50 to 75 cells. So there are different types, three main types. So the most uh, Abundant one is the long, uh, that is the tubular uh, cells, which are called as gustatory cells, which you can see here. So this is the long tubular one. So these are the gustatory cells. Okay. <clears throat> and the other cells are immature cells, which are called as supporting cells. They are long slender cells. Then at the base, you will be seeing some basal cells, which acts like a stem cells and helps in replenishing these uh, gustatory cells and some uh, supporting cells. Okay, so this is the base. Uh, mainly this ovoid structure rests on the basal lamina. Okay, and there are nerve endings. These are the axons of the sensory neurons. Okay, so these mainly innervate the gustatory cells, which carry means which carries the taste sensation at the apex you can see uh, there are my gustatory microvilli okay so there are some projections here so those are called as gustatory microvilli which opens into a pore called as taste pore okay so whatever the taste tends whatever you eat the food which you eat which has a molecules uh, also called as taste tends so they enter the taste pore, which enters the microvilla and then it is sensed by these nerve endings. So they are carried through these nerve endings. So these are called as the taste pore. Okay, so this is the structure of the uh, taste buds, <clears throat> which are more uh, numerous in the circumvallate papillae. So gustatory cells or the taste cells, they are elongated and they have a lifespan of 7 to 10 days, so they turn over. So mainly the basal cells or the stem cells, so they help, they actually divide and give rise to other two types, that is the supportive cells and the gustatory cells. And the afferent sensory axons form synapses on the gustatory cells. Let's move on to histology of esophagus. So esophagus is a long hollow tube which forms a part of the digestive tract. So their main function is to transport the food which is ingested from the oral cavity into the uh, uh, stomach. Okay, so this is the continuation of the oropharynx. Okay, so they uh, extend from the oropharynx till the stomach. So their main function is to transport the food. Okay. So let us know about the features of the esophagus. So they have the same four layers. So four general layers of the digestive tract. Okay, having a mucosa with the lining epithelium. Okay, so they are mainly lined by stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. Since they are uh, helping, they help in the transport of the food. Okay, so there is more friction whenever there is passage of this bolus of the food. So to withstand those friction, which are which is caused by the bolus of the food, so that's why they are lined by for protection. They are lined by stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. Okay, so they have the multiple layer for protection. Then uh, there is lamina propria, that is a layer of connective tissues, and also a thin layer of muco muscularis mucosae. Next, coming to the submucosa, 
So the submucosa uh, here in the esophagus have mucus secreting glands. So those are called as esophageal glands or submucosal glands since they are present in the esophagus. So that's why it's called as esophageal gland. So this is one of the uh, main features of the esophagus. Okay. So how it is different from the other uh, parts of the digestive tract is one is lining epithelium, stratified squamous, non-keratinized epithelium. The other one is presence of esophageal glands in the submucosa. So the mucus secreted by this esophageal glands, they help, they facilitate gliding easy okay smooth gliding of the bolus of the foot along the mucosa I and mean, it's along the esophagus and also they help in lubricating and protecting the mucosa then the next is the muscular layer that is the uh, muscularis uh, externa so this uh, layer this muscle layer they help in the peristaltic movement which helps in the propulsion of the bolus of the foot towards the stomach okay and the, since the esophagus, uh, if you can see, uh, the esophagus is not enclosed. It's an extra peritoneal organ. So they are not enclosed by the peritoneum except the distal portion, the most distal portion of the esophagus have where it is continuous with the stomach. So there you will be seeing a layer of peritoneum. So most distal portion of the esophagus is enclosed by peritoneum. So that's why there it has serosa. But the rest of the esophagus has just a layer of connective tissue, loose connective tissue. So that's why they are, it is called as adventitia. Okay. So these are the main microscopic features of the esophagus. So here you can see the HND staining of the esophagus in a lower magnification. So they having the stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. Then you can see lamina propria over here. Okay. This is the duct. This is muscularis mucosa, a thin layer. Then in the submucosa, this is the main feature in the esophagus having a mucus secreting glands. Okay, also you can see the duct over here. And when you when you move on to the muscularis externa, in the esophagus, they have uh, both kinds, that is both skeletal and smooth muscle. So it differs. Uh, since esophagus is a long hollow uh, tube-like structure, so it is divided into upper one third, middle one third and lower one third. So in the upper one third, the muscularis externa mainly has skeletal muscles. Okay, so there you will be seeing since it is a continuation from the oropharynx. So there uh, the muscles are skeletal muscle cells. Okay, as it comes to the middle one third, so there will be both uh, skeletal muscle cells and also smooth muscle cells. Then as it goes to the lower one third, so there exclusively you will be seeing the smooth muscle cells. Okay. So these are the different muscle cells present in, in the esophagus. Okay. So here in this picture it is showing the muscularis external layer. So here mainly you will be seeing the skeletal muscles because skeletal muscles they are striated muscles having multinucleated uh, nucleus. Uh, multi, they are multinucleated, peripherally arranged. So this might be the skeletal muscle layer. Okay. <clears throat> so to summarize the histology of the esophagus, mucosa epithelium is stratified. So the one which I have uh, highlighted with the red in color means that is the main feature. Okay. The main uh, 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 features of the microscopic feature of the esophagus. So epithelium is stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. So that's very important. So this you have to mention stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. Then in the submucosa it has the submucous secreting glands which is called as esophageal glands. Okay along with that when, it, when you go to the cardiac end, that is the distal end of the esophagus where it is continuous with the cardio of the stomach. So in the lamina propria, you will be seeing esophageal cardiac lungs. Okay, so this is in the region near to the stomach. The muscle layer, upper one third is skeletal, middle one third is smooth and skeletal, lower one third is smooth. Okay, and serosa and adventitia, as I mentioned, distal most portion of the esophagus is enclosed within the peritoneum. So that's why there it is serosa, but rest is just the adventitia. So this is again the picture of 
esophagus. So this is very, you are seeing stratified squamous epithelium with lamina propria. Then you are seeing the layer of muscles, muscularis externa, inner circular and outer longitudinal. This picture is showing the distal portion of the esophagus. So how I can tell that this is the distal portion? Can you see the transition of the epithelium? So here, this is the part of the esophagus. This part, there is a line over here, right? So this part represents the stomach area. That is mainly the cardia of the stomach. Okay. So here you can see stratified squamous epithelium as it goes to the, forms the stomach the cardio of the stomach there is a transition from stratified squamous epithelium to simple columnar epithelium okay so this is simple columnar epithelium okay and you can see the gastric pits over here so i'll be talking about the microscopic feature of the stomach in my next video in detail about these pits and as i mentioned earlier as the esophagus is nearing at the distal portion in the lamina propria, you can see some mucus secreting glands. So these are called as esophageal cardiac glands. Okay, esophageal because it is part of the esophagus and also the cardio of the stomach. So those are called as esophageal cardiac glands. Okay, this is seen in the lamina propria. So this tells that this is the distal portion of the esophagus. This is the cardio of the stomach. Okay, so there is a transition from stratified squamous epithelium to simple columnar epithelium. So this completes the part one of histology of uh, digestive tract. So these are my references. Thank you for watching.